So um, thank you very much for coming, actually, because we're going to talk about uh, one of my personal favorite subjects, of course, which is controllers, and how they uh, controlling the future, basically, when you're looking at AR and VR. So um, that's my talk today. And like I said, thanks for coming. Let me look. When it comes to controllers and what I'm going to speak about, I'm really talking about the future and and vision and where I see controllers going and this kind of thing. So the the first thing that you're probably going to ask is, why does Gary talk to us about controllers, and what gives him any credibility to talk about controllers to us, right? And so I want to just give you a really short introduction. So I am Gary Yamamoto, and I am CEO and co-founder of a company called Finch Technologies. And Finch Technologies is a company that really just focuses on one thing. We focus on three degree of freedom and six degree of freedom controllers for AR and VR industry. That's all we do. Okay, we don't make controllers or anything else. We only do one thing. And we've been around for about three years. And we spend uh, all of our time actually talking about controllers and thinking about controllers and building controllers and building software for controllers. So um, we really are into the industry. The other thing uh, is that we are actually really part of the industry. So. Finch Technologies works really closely uh, and has worked and does work closely with HTC. So I think most of you know the, uh, the Focus headset, right? Of course, the HTC Focus headset. When you get one, it comes with a little controller in the box, right? A little blue or white controller in the box. That's one that we worked with HTC on together, so that's our controller. Uh, we will also work on other Sixtoff solutions with them. And we're also very close and work uh, uh, with uh, Qualcomm. So as most of you may have heard, Qualcomm has their uh, HMD accelerator program, the HAP program, right? Uh, so we are, Finch Technologies is the reference, the controller reference design for the HAP program for the Snapdragon 845. So we do work with HTC, we work with um, Qualcomm, and uh, uh, through those experiences and just on our own working in other projects, this is where we really think about controllers a lot. And today I'd like to share with you a little bit about what we think about the future of controllers, not our controllers necessarily, but as an industry, kind of where the controllers are gonna go, right? So, you know, as I said, we wanna talk about where the controllers are going. But I find sometimes it's really important to understand where controllers came from. So for fun, and I think it'll be a little nostalgic for many of you, uh, I have a short video for you guys to show you a little bit about the history of controllers and where they came from. Uh, here you go. So when you see that video, I think most of you recognize a lot of the, a lot of the controllers that were used there, right? My favorite's Atari 2600, actually. But um, what I see and what I think about and what my, what my team thinks about all the time is we think about the evolution of controllers, right? We're thinking about, um, you know, why <laughs> did certain controllers come at certain times? You know, and what we realize is that with every change, step change in technology and in platform, there was a change in controller. There was an inflection in the controller itself, right? And the change in the controller had this effect that it allowed and enabled developers like you, game developers like you, to create different kind of content experiences. Okay, so for with an Atari 2600, you could do certain things. 
but with a we, you could do some other things, right? So the interesting thing about controllers that we saw was that with every change of platform, there's really fundamentally has to be a change of controller in order to allow you as developers to exploit the new platform, right? And so then the question is, of course, where is it going? Because obviously we're all here today in San Francisco because there's this AR, VR change in platform that's you know, coming or here, we might say. But then you have to ask yourself, well, then the old controllers probably were also changed, right? In order to support where it's all gonna go. And that's really what we're talking about today, right? The future. So when you look at the past, you realize, yeah, it's kind of true, right? Every time there's a change in platform, there is a change in controller. And for developers, it enables you to do certain things. And what's gonna happen, we believe and we want, is for you to be enabled in AR and VR to do even more and be more creative, right? So when we look at things like input devices over the years, like I said, you know, two-handed models, you know, these ones you've seen from years ago, you know, this is important, actually. This is really an important thought for just a moment, right? Because in the end of the day, we don't really think of our mobile phone as a controller. I mean, at least I don't, okay, normally. But in fact, it is, right? I mean, we used it as a controller because it was there, it was mobile, it was you know, functional, it was convenient. And there's a lot of attributes of a mobile, mobile uh, phone that makes it very interesting as a controller. We don't necessarily think of it as an input device for gaming, but it really, of course, it is, right? Um, the other thing that, another thing that's very interesting is when you think about the evolution of controllers, kind of where we've been and where we're going, another really interesting thing comes up is that the, with every change in platform, with every change of controller technology, with every change of gaming uh, genre that comes out over time, you, you're going to be actually addressing a different market, a different group of people, right? So what I mean is that, first off, people just get older. But the other thing is like, for instance, in this funny, interesting photo, you have this uh, elderly woman playing with the Wii, right? But it's true that the Wii didn't require you to sit and use like a joystick or something like that. It was much more natural movement, right? So, you know, older people were doing it, younger people were doing it. And this next generation for AR, VR, I don't know what the market demographic's gonna look like. I really don't. But what I know is that it's probably gonna be different than, for instance, today's market demographic, or at least it could be. It could open up gaming to people who today don't game, but because it's an AR experience or a VR experience and they're doing it anyway for work or whatever because they have the equipment, they start to use it, right? So I think that it's really important to recognize that these changing controllers, these changing platforms, right now, there may be a new generation of user that actually didn't exist, that doesn't play today or are interested today, but they may be tomorrow. And I think a lot of it has to do with the total system experience, including the input device, right? So, again, the Wii, and I'm gonna bring this up just as an example. I mean, we all remember before Wii, and then we remember after Wii in some ways, right? But it was kind of revolutionary, right? That you had not a joystick, or you weren't on your keyboard kind of thing, but really you were able to move around with, with this, with this uh, the new Wii device. And it was really quite, from a controller input point of view, um, it was different, right? I mean, it was something to think about. And I think it allowed uh, game developers like yourselves uh, to create content that you weren't able to use, I'd say, on a previous generation of controller, right? And this is what's important. It's not necessarily what was done with the Wii, but the fact that I think we allowed us the freedom to do something new, something that hadn't been done before, right? It, it, it was an enabler, right? So now we go on a little bit forward. So I talked about the past, I talked about inflection points, and about the power of input devices. But of course, we all know there are challenges in VR and AR controllers, right? I think you've seen them, you've seen uh, some of the positives and some of the negatives. So let's talk a little bit about, not the past, but let's talk a little bit about the present today before we talk about the future, right? And some of the biggest challenges that you see, so today in AR, VR technologies, um, I think most of you are familiar, but let's just run through some of the more popular ones. So there's, of course, optical, uh, uh, optical technologies for controllers, right? And when we say optical, I think in this genre, I'm kind of talking about two different kinds of things. So uh, I think all of you guys know, of course, the original Vive controller, right, that goes with the Vive system. So really you're talking about the big ones they had around, and they're using these cameras that are mounted on the ceilings, right, to optically monitor your movements and translate that into VR, right? So that's optical in some ways. But there's also optical now when you're talking about headsets, right? You have the cameras in the headset, they're actually tracking 
the motion of the controllers. You know, uh, uh, of course, Oculus Quest is a great example. They're coming out with the Quest. There are four cameras, right? They're really going to be tracking hand movements as well as doing other things. Accuracy is good, but one of the limitations still in it and challenge, let's say, just say challenge, right, is that uh, even a great uh, two or four camera system, as soon as you move your arm out of the field of view, then the cameras are no longer working, right? I mean, they're, they're no longer able to track, right? So you have field of view issues uh, even with great ca camera systems, but let's be honest, camera systems are great. Some of the upsides, uh, accuracy is good. Some of the downsides, they can use a lot of computing power, which for, game, for developers, that's an issue. They can use a lot of battery power. Nothing against them, just, we're just talking, right? What are some of the challenges that we're trying to face and trying to overcome, right? So there's electromagnetic. Also, uh, you know, we've looked at that, we've discussed that a lot. Electromagnetic also has some positives and negatives, right? Oftentimes it needs a base station or at least a receiver somewhere kind of near the headset as well. That can be issues. There's, there's some issues with, uh, with that. Ultrasonic, again, can work. Uh, it's good. It has some positives, has some negatives. Sometimes you get interference. It's not about analyzing each one today. That's not what I'm trying to do. I'm not trying to be pick one or, or pick another. Take IMU-based, okay? So IMU-based, uh, three DOF controllers, all three degree, almost all three degree of freedom controllers use IMU-based, right? Uh, but there are issues with IMU base. You know, again, if you want to do a lot of tracking, sometimes you need a lot of IMUs all over your body. This is a little bit inconvenient. It could take you, you know, minutes or, you know, dozens of minutes to just suit up. So, I mean, these, there are issues with all of them, right? Nice thing about IMU based, you don't have any limitations of field of view, you don't have occlusions, they're relatively inexpensive, blah, 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 right? But what I'm saying is, it's not so much that. What I'm saying is that today, I think, I think, and, you know, I'd open it up to you guys, but, I think that there really is no clear solution yet for AR and VR. What is the perfect controller yet? And I think it's logical in some ways, right? Because we really are at just the beginning of what is going to be a great wave, right? It, it, we all know that, I think. We, we all feel it, right? And in the controller space, which is what I think about all the time, right? Is it's true, right? It's not, there's no clear technology that everybody has agreed on that solves all the problems that's perfect. And I think as game developers, what you're thinking is, okay, you know, what, we need it. We need something that's gonna work really great. What is it gonna be? How is it gonna work, right? But I think it's really important. And what's interesting is when I look at the evolutionary aspect of controllers, the Darwinism aspect, you know, it's true, right? Which controllers have succeeded over the, the last few decades? Which ones did the game developers embrace because they allowed you, those controllers allowed you to create the content you wanted to create at that moment in time, right? And it's funny because when I go back, okay, here's a, here's a question. This is called the Fragmaster, and it was created by a company called Thrustmaster, and it's a controller. Now, in one of the reviews I read, they said, someone said it looked more like a futuristic uh, toilet, but it's an actual controller. I have a question for you. Has anybody ever seen the Fragmaster or used the Fragmaster before? Just raise your hand if you have. No, nobody, none of you have ever seen the Fragmaster? I'm serious, no, no one? Come on, wait, maybe I'm, no one. Okay, I am not kidding, okay? You can go online and buy this on eBay, okay? Because it's kind of a nostalgic piece. It is a real controller, and it really was developed, and it was really commercialized and sold, okay? The fact that none of you ever used it is kind of highlighting exactly what I'm saying about the Darwin effect, you know, the evolutionary effect of controllers. The reason why Fragmaster didn't work, okay, maybe because they didn't like the form factor, which is part of it, right? I mean, if, if your gamers don't like touching it, <laughs> it's not a good way to sell your apps, right? You're gaming your game. So it, it didn't make it. But is Fragmaster part of the evolution of controllers? Absolutely, right? Because, because of it, we knew what not <laughs> to build. This is not gonna make it. And this is what we think about today, right? Not all controllers, not all input devices are gonna quote unquote make it, right? In the end of the day, there probably is gonna be a, a standard or a few standards, but some are gonna make it and some aren't. And this is a really good example to think about, right, as developers, right? It didn't make it because the form factor probably because of some limitation and because people just didn't like to use it. Another one, Atari 2600, as it worked. Why? Maybe because it was simple, don't know, but it did. And this is really an important aspect, right? So when we start to talk now, we talked about the past, right? We're talking about the present, about the challenges that we're facing trying to come up with a great controller for you to develop on, right? So now let's look a little bit to the future, right? And really, with AR, VR, as I said, 
it is a new platform. It is a new space. We know that. And let's talk about some of the attributes of this new space that we're going to go to. So first one, really, I think, just is basic, right? With AR and VR, you can have natural, full freedom of motion. I mean, real full freedom of motion, right? Not limited to what's on your screen in front of you, right? But full freedom. We think this is an attribute. And let me give you an example of what I mean, right, on a video. Right? So again, full freedom of motion, right? What we really want to be able to do is do this. Okay, I actually can't do those poses myself, but if I could do those poses, I'd want to be able to do those poses, and I'd want them translated into the VR uh, environment, as an example, right? So really, I think, fundamentally, what we really want is full freedom of motion. And it's really important to keep that in mind all the time, because in other platforms, full freedom of motion in a controller wasn't actually possible and wasn't even on the list of things, right? Because we just realized there was a limitation to what we could do. But in AR and VR, we don't see that. We believe that really you can get full freedom of motion. And it comes in very, and it can be an exciting new area for developers to be able to really exploit that concept, full freedom. You know, whether it's bows, whether it's, it's swords, whether it's playing sports games, this is really, a, really an exciting area. So that, that's one. Second one, we, we understand now, right, that the AR, VR environment is really built for mobility. It's really built for mobility, right? I mean, if you think about previous systems, right, you really can't walk, walk you know, over here, go outside into the garden, you know, go to the local pub, or whatever, and still, still be engaged with your environment, right? Of course, there's a limitation. But with AR and VR, you can pretty much just walk anywhere and go anywhere, and you have real, you should have, you should be able to develop content that exploits full mobility. That's what I think you should have. I mean, that's what I think the industry looks for. But there's something else about mobility that's interesting, is also portability. So not just physical portability, but the portability of being able to go from an iOS system or uh, uh, games that develop that into some other system and still use the same controller, right? Because at the moment, what happens is everyone's kind of digging around for the controller that goes with that system, right? But I think ultimately for game, game developers, what would be great is you can develop on multiple platforms and use one controller, and it's cross-platform, right? It's, it's portable between platforms. Again, is it idealistic? Is it possible? That's not really the question. The question is, what do we want? Right, because we're at the start. We can ask ourselves, what do we want in a controller not what's not possible, right? So I think portability, mobility, and portability across platforms is huge. Another big one that I really think is important, and I hope <laughs> it'll resonate with you. You see, the other problem that we're looking at when you look to the future of AR, VR, right, is that it has to be affordable solutions, right? Because otherwise what happens is you have a very nice, very cool controller, but it's very expensive, okay? So now for the, the development community, you guys are kind of like, you know, working in a really elite, great group, but it's a very relatively small group, right? And I think for developers who are trying to get it out to them, get your games and your content out to the masses, you need a controller, which is affordable, right? With that the masses can buy and use and carry in their pocket, and it works well, right? And that you're really now able to distribute your apps, your games across maybe numerous platforms, but also amongst all a huge population, young people, older people, you know, middle-aged people, uh, you know, men, women, it doesn't matter, the, you know, industries, across industries in every way. I think the key, though, in order to do that, it has to be affordable. Geographically, you want to sell it in all countries. So if we only tier it to, you know, rich people, you know, who can afford really high-end systems, I think we're doing ourselves a disservice, and I think it's not in what we, on our checklist of what we'd like to see in a controller. I don't think that's it. I think we need affordability and, a, and one that is uh, able to hit the masses, right? Last, I think, is this concept of control without a controller, right? 
is that, yes, we want natural movement. You know, we, there's a lot of aspects that we want. But one of the things I think that's really we can do when we want to do is what we see, you know, in Ready Player One, or we saw in Minority Report, or we see in these other kind of future visions where really you can interact almost seamlessly with your environment in a control environment, interact with your apps without having to say, oh, you know, where did I put that controller? You know, it was here, I, I thought I left it in the kitchen, I thought it was on the couch, but no, wait a minute, hold on, I, bedroom, it must be in the bedroom. No, that's not what you want, right? Don't you want just seamless control? So basically control without a controller, that was what was so cool when you're just swiping things, you know, and you're just whoop, and things are there, and you're using tools. This is kind of really where we want to go. Again, oftentimes we say to ourselves, yeah, okay, yeah, but this isn't, you know, this is the reality. The reality is control without a controller isn't possible. But that's not the question today, right? What I'm talking about is controlling the future. What I'm talking about is the future. And what do we want out of our controller future, our interactive future? That's really the question today, right? Not limiting ourselves to what's not possible, but what we want to be possible, right? So what I want to mention now is something really important. Because again, we're talking about the future. We're talking about the past. There is a kind of a hero of mine, uh, Miyamoto-san, and he, as I think many of you guys know, uh, was really a visionary in the industry for gaming, right? And he had this quote a few years ago, which really resonates with me, and I think it talks about fundamentally what I'm trying to talk about today, right? Which is that it's really, you know, it isn't really only about the game, right? It really w never was about that. It was creating something. He wanted to create something, basically anything, which was far bigger than himself, right? To take you know, it to the next level, right? To whatever it is, whatever ideas you're, you're, you have in your minds today that you could create any whatever game, whatever app that you're thinking about today that you'd like to create, it's enabling, the controller and the system should enable you to really do something which is even bigger than just yourself, right? Really change the industry, really t exploit AR and VR, right, to its potential, to its full potential, and not be held back by the constraints of, as an example, the input device, right? I think this is fundamentally what I think about all the time. I want to enable you to really do something great, something revolutionary, that people look at it and say, wow. Just wow. That is so cool. That is the coolest game I've ever seen. I didn't even think that game was possible, and now, and they play, and they don't think about the controller. Nobody thinks about the controller. They shouldn't think about the controller. All they think about is this amazing, immersive experience that they're having because of what you've created, because of what you created, something which was bigger than yourselves, right? And I think that's really critical. So when I look at the next generation controller, right, and this is where we're at today, I think about the attributes that I think are important, and I've covered them, but I'm gonna cover them one more time, right? So I firmly believe natural movement is really important. And let me just give you one example, right, that I haven't mentioned, but I wanna throw this out. We all know Pokemon Go. I like Pokemon Go, to be perfectly honest. And I, you know, often pull out my phone and I'm playing. But what's interesting about Pokemon Go to me is something very strange, okay? When I wanna throw the ball, yeah, I always just flick. Of course we all flick, right? We're constantly flicking. And when I'm playing a lot, like in a park, I'm really flicking all the time, and I'm worried I'm gonna run into something because I'm flicking all the time, but you're flicking. And why do you flick? I mean, what's the whole point? You're flicking because, you, because you're trying, the, the developer did a great job. He found a way to simulate with a phone screen, right, the throwing of a ball, right? If you flick harder, it goes farther. If you flick softer, it drops in front of you, right? But actually, right, that's not, that's not natural, right? What I really want to do is not flick on my screen and worry about hitting a tree. What I really want to do is just pick a ball up and just throw it. That's what I want to do, right? That would be cool, you know? I, and, you know, whatever this display is, but I just want to throw it, and if I throw it really hard and fast, it goes farther, and if I lob it, it goes shorter. That's natural motion, right? That's what I want to be able to do. I want to play tennis, I want to really stroke, not in some way artificially, you know, allow an input that's like stroking, right? What I really want to do is just hit the ball like that with my arm, backhand, forehand, that's what I would love to do. So natural motion is allowing you, right, to really exploit people's real movements instead of simulating, right, in a way, or artificially allowing those movements, but really just let them do it. Bowling ball, you wanna go bowling? You should be able to just bowl like that. This is what we really, I think, 
want to create in the future of AR, VR controllers. Second one, as I mentioned, portable. And again, mobility is obvious, right? Going up, down is really important. This whole mobility aspect of controllers is really critical and really different. Because even the Wii, right, isn't really a mobile controller. It's kind of tied. But this controller should be portable. It should be mobile. It should be portable. And it should go cross-platform. So portability physically as well as a cross-platform. I think this is something that's on my mind. Affordability, I talked about it. I can't talk about it enough, okay? If we create controllers in the future that are really limited to high-end uh, solutions, I think it's a disservice to everybody. I think we want to create controllers that are affordable for the masses. I think it's really important, and I think it's really possible. And the last one is invisible. That's really what I want to create. I want to create an invisible controller, which is natural, allows natural movement, mobile, interoperability, affordable, but the key, invisible. Invisible. You don't have to look for it. You don't have to think about where do you put it. You don't have to remember which one goes with which system. It's just on demand, controller on demand for AR and VR. This is what I think is really important, and this is where I think the market's really gonna go, uh, and I think it's possible to create. This, at Finch Technologies, that's what we think about all the time. I mean, maybe it's not a very sexy subject, but that's actually what we think about all the time. How to create that solution and deliver it to you to really then exploit uh, the potential for the gaming industry, right? So with that, um, I'm gonna close. And now at this stage of the, uh, of the uh, presentation, I'm supposed to ask, oh, are there any questions? This is the question and answer period. But in fact, I am gonna do that, except in a slightly different way. So uh, in the last couple minutes, I have a question for you. And so please be brave enough if you can to answer it, right? Um, you heard what I said. I said natural, portable, affordable, invisible. But you are the, the ones who are gonna exploit this controller. So I have a question for you guys. Anybody look at the list and say, ah, yeah, but Gary, he forgot the most important thing. He forgot an attribute that I want in my controller as a game developer, and he didn't put it on the list. So I open it up to you guys. My question to you is this. Please, tell me, is there another attribute that you guys would like to see in the future AR, VR controller that I haven't listed yet? Anybody? You have an idea? Yeah, please, go ahead. Uh, what about so give me an example of what you mean. So what he's saying is something that leverages the muscle memory of what you've already learned over playing over years of other stuff. So go ahead, give me an example. I'm not sure. Kind of using previous, I mean, like you said, gestures, using motions, uh, control inputs, like that you already know. Fair enough. I like it. Yeah. Not rebuilding, not re keep remaking, uh, using what we already know. Uh, someone, um, there, uh, I don't know how to explain. Yeah, there, you, you. you. It's, it's a good question for the floor, right? Exactly, so that's a good question, not for me so much, but for everybody else, right? Is, is as game developers, do you even need another controller? Can you use the existing controller for AR, VR development, right? Uh, oh, there on the left? What kind of feedback do you mean? Haptic response. Haptic response. So you'd like to see in this one, haptic response. So not only are you throwing, but you can actually get some kind of a, uh, when you grab something, you can actually feel that you're grabbing it, right? Haptic response. I like it, okay. Uh, over there on the, on the right? An object you can pick up. So the ability, in some ways I'd classify that also in natural motion, right? But in some ways haptic as well, that when you reach down to pick up something virtual, right? You should be able to pick it up, but you should also be able to feel, right? That's what you're saying, right? That you picked it up, as opposed to just 
see that you picked it up. Is that what you mean when you say haptics? And, and when you're talking about uh, being able to pick something up? Ah, okay, 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 okay. I see what you mean, yeah. It, it translates it into the reality, real, real world, right? So with that, um, I'm just at 3.30, so I should let you guys go to your next uh, presentation. Again, I want to thank you very much for coming and, and, and hearing about uh, Finch Technologies vision for the future. You want to catch up with me later, you're welcome to. I'll be around for a little bit. And uh, otherwise, have a lovely afternoon, and thank you very much.